this is Slavika Bogdanov here. Welcome to this channel called NAVS. NAVS stands for Narcissistic Abuse Victims and Survivors. The point of this channel is to educate, is also to help you heal, understand better, and hopefully help you get out of a narcissistic abuse uh, relationship if you are in one, but at least help you heal and also um, hopefully prevent more cases of abuse in the future. Uh, you can join us on Facebook. You will see the link below this video. And also I invite you to go to our website called NarcissicAbuseVictims.com. You will see that we raise funds uh, for many different things. One is to offer funds to other organizations who help victims and survivors, such as the Domestic Violence Hotline, such as CTPSD, such as Victim Voice and others. So if you go on our website, you'll see what other organizations we are helping and working together with. Also, I want to make a documentary or docu-series to bring more awareness and education. And I want to create a mega fund that will be a wallet to wallet kind of um, no interest loans to help victims in rough situation get at least a minimum amount of money so they can exit the relationship without having to worry. Because as we know, most of the times abusers hold a wallet. And also I want to uh, have give the opportunity to survivors to have education and skills and learn new things so that can, they can re-enter the workplace without a fear of cost of any types of education. So it would be free courses on coding, for example, or other courses. So welcome, welcome. And uh, I'm so happy uh, to have um, my dear uh, Priscilla Burt here with me. So thank you, Priscilla, for coming and being willing to share, open up, and hopefully help others understand and cope with narcissistic abuse. So welcome on this thank you. channel. Thank you so much. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you. thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm really excited. Well, thank you so much. So if you want to share, um, like, what happened to you? Uh, what were the circumstances in which you had uh, encountered narcissistic abuse? And then we can maybe discuss what were the signs, how it made you feel, how you moved out, and all of that stuff. Yeah, of course. Um, so um, I grew up in um, like a very um, crazy environment. Um, you know, that's really the only word to describe it. Um, my parents um, only thought of themselves. Um, they um, were obsessed with, um, you know, reading the Bible to like an extensive amount and talking about Jesus and God all the time. Um, there was very little room for my own personality to even exist alongside their personalities. Um, and of course I was very young, um, so I didn't understand what all of that meant. You know, I was still like going to school and, you know, managing, like, you know, going into like having, uh, you know, conflicts with friends. And then it became more of an issue where my home environment started to like seep into like going to school in that environment, as well as like my relationships with my friends. Um, so I saw a lot of like uh, right and wrongs, but I didn't know, like, I guess I really didn't understand like what was right and what was wrong. It just like felt wrong, but it's hard when you're a kid to put that into words. Um, so um, that can like make you make choices that aren't in your best interest and le it leads you into like doing dangerous things that um, can have lifelong repercussions. Um, so when you're raised by two people who um, show narcissistic personality traits, you are like, you're just like, you don't even exist really in their mind. Um, your problems, your feelings, your thoughts, your ideas, everything that makes you you does not exist in their world. Only thing that exists is them. 
And if you start to show any signs of needing something from them, they will just automatically say no every single time. Um, when I was a kid, um, I had a lot of thoughts and ideas. I was just like a naturally creative person. I loved writing. I loved putting on plays. I loved watching movies. I would go to the library and I wasn't allowed to watch like a PG-13 movie because that was like anti-Christianity. Um, so I would like to the library and I would get a library card and just buy as many, like not buy, but I would get as many movies as I could. And I would just like watch them late at night when my parents were sleeping and stuff. Um, and I would get books that my parents would like not approve of. And I would just sneak them in my, my bag and I would just bring them home and read them. Um, so, you know, uh, I wanted to uh, leave home eventually one day and go to California and make movies and go to Universal Studios and go to Disney World and just have like this amazing like fun-filled adventure you know that like you know um, seems so childish now but in reality it's not childish at all you know it's what makes you you and my parents like did not approve of any of this. Um, I had a Marilyn Monroe uh, picture in my bedroom. My dad threw it in the garbage. Um, so, you know, there was just these things that like people who want to control you, people who um, don't want you to be you, uh, they're going to do things that are just reckless um, and they're going to hurt you no matter what. That's their goal, their aim. If they see the slightest little tiniest bit of like joy in your life, they just want to smother it. Um, they don't want to see you happy because it would remind them of how unhappy they are with themselves. Um, so me being this kid with all these dreams and all these aspirations and just like, you know, having these long, deep conversations with my parents about what I wanted to do with my life. That just upset them you know they got jealous um my mom would read my diary for instance there was no boundaries at all um that's definitely like a key element when you are with people who have narcissistic personalities there's no boundaries you can say hey look these are my boundaries please do not cross them you know these are my rules that I have for my friendships and my relationships with people if you break these rules then you know we're not friends anymore like I don't want to hang out with you anymore I don't want to be around you and they will break those rules on purpose <laughs> and they will cross those boundaries um they'll read your diary um they won't give you any privacy at all um you know I grew up in a family of three sisters three brothers um, two bedroom house. Um, but even though there were like six of us kids, that's a lot of different personalities right there, a lot of different ages. Um, in two bedrooms, basically, <laughs> you were one on top of the other. <laughs> yes, it was crazy. Um, my brothers all shared a room, and then me and my two sisters, we shared a room. Um, then when my sister went away to college, I got a room to myself and I was like so thrilled, so overjoyed. I finally have like my own space. I painted it, I decorated it. I just like used all of my creativity to like make it mine. And, you know, then my sister came back from college to visit and she also has like that narcissistic personality. And she was like, this is my room now. And I was like, wait, what? Like, I, you've been away at college. Like, you have a dorm, you have a life outside of college, you're just visiting. Like, you can sleep on the couch or you can share, you know, sleep in the other bedroom with my other sister. And, you know, I'm not giving up my bed. Like, what? That's crazy. And she's like, get out of my, this is my room now. Whenever I'm here, it's my room. And she would help herself to my clothes. Um, <laughs> she would help herself to everything that was in my room and just made it hers. Um, there was no boundaries. Like I would explain to her, like, these are my clothes and I don't want you to wear them. Um, I had a job at 16. So I was already buying my own clothes at that point by the time I got my own bedroom. So, and I had bought the paint myself. I had decorated myself. So I literally had worked for everything that was in that room. And she just was like, oh, it's mine. And I'm like, what? No, it's not. Um, so I have a question. So how, um, so your parents 
they still allowed you to have a job? What, why was that? Well, actually, it really wasn't like they allowed me to have a job. They rather me have a job than be in school. Um, oh, I was, I yeah, I actually um, started working probably when I was like 15 and I was in high school and there was a Planet Wings down the road from the high school. And my dad knew one of the delivery drivers. They had been like lifelong friends. And so he's like, you can go work here because we're like, we don't have enough money to really like support you. And at this point I had like already transitioned into like puberty and like I'd already grown. And, you know, I was going through the emotions of a 16 year old young woman and everything that comes with that. And now on top of having to manage that, I also now had to manage having a job. So I had homework, I had a job. I wouldn't get home till like almost 11 o'clock at night. I was at the restaurant most of the time by myself with the two chefs. Well, they were like more like cooks, but like the thing is like, they were just like making me, like forcing me into adulthood very rapidly. And that was like not healthy at all because it wasn't like I came home at 11 o'clock at night and then I didn't have school the next day and it was the weekend. I could do homework or I'd hang out with my friends. If I wanted to hang out with my friends, I had to have money to hang out with them. My parents wouldn't give me the money. If I wanted to buy new shoes, my parents wouldn't give me the money for new shoes. They make me go work. And I'm not anti young, you know, teenagers having jobs like summer jobs or whatever like that. But if they have like a healthy life at home and they can balance it and they're not like overworking themselves, then great. That's awesome. But my parents weren't like, uh, giving me that choice. They were like, you have to do this. Like you have to have a job. And so that became a lot. I actually started suffering from depression because of it. Um, I couldn't maintain my relationships with my friends anymore. Um, my youngest sister, Bethany, was like doing all the wrong things. And she was like 14. So she was like in a lot of like trouble um, with like who she was hanging out with. Um, you know, that's where like, you know, drug addiction comes in, you know, that's like a pandemic. And unfortunately, you know, she became a victim to that. And so I was dealing with like that on top of my Sir Rachel, like, you know, not really being sisterly towards me and just like, you know, coming over to the home and, you know, uh, just taking all my stuff. So it was like, while I was over here working on like a job and trying to maintain helping, like letting my manager know I'm a good employee, my grades were suffering because I was at work focusing on that because my parents put so much emphasis on that. And then the, now my grades were suffering. And so my one of my teachers who I had in um, seventh grade, again, I had her in high school and she's like, you're so different from you when you were seventh grade. Like what happened to you? You're a totally different person. And I'm like, that kind of just stuck with me. And after she said that, she was my favorite teacher. She was my English teacher. Um, so after she said that, I I was like, oh my God, like I need to do something different with my life. Like I can't be working at Planet Wings at forever. Like I can't be suffering at home forever. So I made a plan to get my GED and like go away to college and just start a whole new life, get out away from my parents, get away from all of it. But I had no family support. My family did not support me getting my GED. They did not support me going away to college. They didn't support anything except me having a job at Planet Wings. I mean, it was just, it didn't make any sense. Um, so eventually- so do you think they were, why do you think that is? Do you think they wanted you to be belittled or what? why do you think they didn't want you to succeed with college or education and wanted you to stay in a, in a, in a job in, in that little restaurant? I think it's because of the fact that me doing something I actually enjoyed would make me happy and they didn't want to see me happy. And that's the biggest thing with a narcissistic personality is if it makes you happy, they're automatically not going to be happy for you because now they're like, oh, wow, she actually has like a dream. She actually has like hope. She actually still has like, like goodness in her like oh wow I can't stand that I have to or just, is it yeah. because they think that they are the only ones who should make you happy and you cannot have happiness from anything else is that potentially um, 
I don't think, I think. Did they ever make you happy? Did they buy you things to make you happy or celebrate your birthday or um, you well, they When I was a little kid, yes. When I was like, you know, six or seven years old, um, they had all the, they had birthday parties and they had friends um, and they had a video camera and they would like record the birthdays and like, you know, we would go on trips and stuff. But then um, my mom actually uh, got pregnant when she was about 42 years old and it was very dangerous for her to be pregnant. So that led to her like wanting to have the baby anyway, despite it being very dangerous for her and the baby. And she ended up having my brother Jacob who has Down syndrome. And that became her sole purpose in life to, to, to just take care of him and make him like sole purpose of caring for him all the time. And she pushed us into like a Catholic school because we were homeschooled actually for a little while. And then she pushed us into public school and, but that's fine. Like it's fine to send your kids to school, obviously. But when we were coming home from school, then we were like in the car going to a church, like all the time, or we, or my parents were like, you know, just like always focused on something, but like they were forgetting to focus on like the fact that I had homework or the fact that like, you know, my sister Bethany, for instance, started becoming addicted to drugs and they like that just to the, they didn't even notice that. And they were so focused on other things besides us as children. Like they were so focused on their own soul needs and then when I would say something like, hey, like, you know, there's something I really want to do. You're my parents. I look to you for support. Their answer was always, no, we don't want to support you. And then, you know, they would like just try to take advantage of the fact that I needed help. Um, I went to California and they sold my car. <laughs> and like, you know, because I asked them to watch my car for me while I was gone and they sold it and it was really hard to get the money from them. Um, and then, you know, I had them holding on to like some blankets and stuff. And instead of taking care of them, they threw them in the garage and like, like uh, caterpillars got in them. Like, there's just like the most like, like horrible scenarios. And I would always be like, I don't understand why you guys can't just like follow like, a, B, C, D, E, F, G to parenting, you have to add in like all these like random surprises that are really just like nightmares to deal with and their catastrophes. And eventually it just got so toxic. That's the other thing too, is it's very toxic environment. And it got so toxic that I just, I had to like get out of there. I had to leave. Um, I met this woman and um, she wanted me to like be her personal assistant and like write a, her biography for her. So I lived with her. Um, I wrote her biography for her. And then I found out I was pregnant for the first time. Yay. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And um, she actually had an incredible story about how she was a single mom most of her life. Um, you know, and she was raising her son by herself and she had a lot of support from like neighbors and other and friends. And she had this amazing career working at IBM and traveling and stuff, being on radio. But then when I told her I was pregnant and it so happened, you know, the dad wasn't interested and my parents weren't interested in helping. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to be a single mom, but whatever, like I can do it. Like I want my baby, like this is going to be cool. Fresh new start. My start of my family and she was like bye she like it was like nope I don't want to be in the same environment as a you and a baby and everything and I was like I just wrote your biography for you on how like you had this incredible incredible life of being a single mom and now you're like bye and I'm just potentially like, she didn't want to do it again <laughs> yeah she was like oh yeah. And I'm like, we have a three bedroom apartment. Like I'm finishing up school. You know, we had so many like career plans together and she was just like, nope. I, so I actually have to go live in a shelter, unfortunately. Um, 
I reached out to my parents before I made that decision to kind of like see like if they were going to be supportive and how they were going to be supportive. Um, because those are two very different things. Someone can be supportive of you, but it's really like how they're supportive that actually matters. Um, because they can say, oh, I'll take care of you financially. But like you were describing earlier with the narcissistic personality, they might just like hold on to the wallet. You know, they might hold on to your purse. Um, you know, I I've heard crazy stories about like husbands locking purses in uh, safes. So like the wife can't even get to her purse or her phone. And I'm just like, oh my God, just the second you get a chance, just get out of there. Like, you know, call 911, whatever you got to do. Um, it's, you know, obviously it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, but, you know, still it's good to like encourage people to get out of those situations. Um, so I, I got out of my parents' home, but then I was in another situation where this person just like, you know, I was like there for her 24 seven, like listening to her story, writing her book, you know, being supportive of her career ambitions. She had recently like gotten a divorce and um, I was supportive of that decision for her because that was the healthiest decision for her at the time. But then she also wanted to get her job back at the radio station. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, like I support you with that. And like, maybe we can like team up and I can be your assistant at the radio station. She's like, yeah, 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 sure. And then she got her job back at the radio station, didn't even mention me. And I was just like, I, like we lived together. I wrote your biography, I don't understand. So again, it's like people will make choices that like really only benefit them and not you. And that's a huge red flag to watch out for, especially if they like already told you they want to be your teammate, if they want to be there for you. Um, this could be, you know, your partner, your spouse, whoever it is. Um, but if they start doing things that only benefit themselves and they, but with you suffering, like that's a warning. You don't like, they don't have to make you suffer. Like what, why add that into the mix? You know, it can be like a recipe. Um, you know, you have your eggs, your milk, your flour, you mix it all together and it comes out to be this beautiful cake. But if they're trying to like add in like some, you know, like soap into that cake or something like that, you're like, that doesn't go in there. <laughs> what are you doing? Like, that's not how the recipe works. Um, so that's what just so like tell me how how is it now how is your life now what are you doing now and how did you uh, kind of um heal from all of that yeah of course um so after i um got into the shelter and I had my daughter, um, I got to be like by myself. Like I had never lived like alone before. I had lived with my parents. I lived with my oldest sister and her husband. I had been in a military environment living in a boot camp. Um, so I never actually lived like by myself. And when I finally got that opportunity, I had my own little apartment. It was very clean. Um, it was like nicer than the place that had been before. Um, and I had my daughter, I was like, I really am happy. Like there's no people trying to hurt me. It's just me doing my thing. And I got to discover more about myself. I got to spend more time doing the things that I enjoy doing. Um, you know, I got to take pictures and videos of my daughter and, you know, she's a part of me. So it was just so much joy. I was filled with so much. I named her love actually. Yeah, um, that's beautiful. yeah, I did. I named her love. I, because I was just filled with so much love and I was able to just be at peace and that quietness, there was no chaos. It was just quiet peace. And, um, I got a great caseworker who she really helped me as far as like making plans for, you know, the financial, um, you know, success that I was going to need in order to take care of my daughter. Um, I wasn't able to really like, find my dream job right away. Um, but then over some time, I learned that I should just like create my own dream job. Like I shouldn't keep waiting for someone to give it to me. I should just make it myself. So I actually came up with a business plan um, for a place that single moms could go to and they could find their dream job and they could get supported with that. And 
I went and spoke with a local businesswoman who runs like the organization for women business um, in the Hudson Valley. And she was like, well, I like your plan, but you need to write it. You need to have like paper and write it all down. And I'm like, oh my God, how am I going to do that? Like, I don't even know where to start. So after some time, some serious contemplating, I went to business school. And while I was in business school, I learned about what motivates people. And I'm like, huh, this is such an interesting topic. What motivates people? Like, why do people want to go to work and the reasoning behind it? Why do some people behave this way and others behave that way? So then I got into industrial and organizational psychology. <laughs> so um, I started studying that. And um, I'm sorry, my battery's running low here. Um, so I was like, wow, this is really, I love this subject. I just am so thrilled with it. Um, but then, you know, I had a job at the time at Dunkin' Donuts and the management shifted and I wasn't being respected. So I went out to California to live with my sister who was like you know, making all these promises of like a beautiful, wonderful life in California. I got, I like left my apartment, you know, gave my car and my stuff to my parents, went out to California, I got there and my sister didn't like, had no plan. There was just, there was no plan. So I ended up going to this hotel because I'm like trying to figure out what the heck I'm going to do. I left my apartment. I can't go back there. I don't have a job. Like, what am I going to do? So I go get stay in this hotel. And then my sister who is sharing an apartment with her boyfriend is like, can I stay with you in this hotel? I don't want to stay with my boyfriend. And I'm just like, what? Um, okay, sure. So she's like staying with me in my hotel. And I'm like, you know, I need a plan. Like I have to like call like social services or a local shelter because I have no idea what I'm going to do. I thought I was coming here to live with you. And now you don't even have a place and you don't even have anything. So I was really confused. And she was like, well, I'm not going to support you going into a shelter. And I was just like, but I need a permanent place to live until I can get a job. I have a daughter. And she's like, I don't support you. I don't support you. And I was just like, okay, well, I guess I'm going back to New York then. So I called up my parents and they were like, oh, you, oh, can't you stay with Rachel? Can't you stay with Rachel? I'm like, no, I can't stay with her. Like, she's like, doesn't even have a home for me. And they were like, oh, well, okay, why don't you go down to Florida, stay with your grandma for a little bit. Now, I haven't spoken with my grandma in like 20 years. Like, she's not the grandma that like, you know, comes to your graduations and like bakes you cookies. She lives in Florida by herself. She like, doesn't speak to me like ever. So I'm like, oh yeah, I'm going to totally go stay with her, right? Okay. So I call her up. I'm like, this is the situation. Can I come stay with you? And she was like, there's a hurricane in Florida. You can't come here. <laughs> I was like, what? I was like, I need to go somewhere. So I couldn't go back to New York. I could only, I guess I only had enough money to go to Florida. And I was like, all right, I'm just going to go out there and just say, hey, surprise, grandma. <laughs> like, I don't know what else to do. So I went out there and she was in bad shape because of the hurricane. Like, you know, she hadn't like bathed in a while and she didn't have any electricity. And I was like, all right, I'm going to try to help my grandma out right now. Like, I'm going to be like, let's go stay at a hotel so you can shower. So, you know, we can get a. Opa. Oh, uh, Opa. Uh. We had a little had a little glitch, so you're back. So yeah, so where we left off, so you were going to your grandma, then you went to the hotel with her. I'm wondering, so um, how, where are you now? Um, right now, I'm in New York. Um, okay. Yep, I made it back to New York. Um, I'm living in Poughkeepsie right now with my two daughters and my husband. Oh, um, so you're remarried. Yes, I'm married. I'm very happy. Um, we just got married in September, you know, because of COVID and everything. So it took us a while. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm doing really well. I, um, I got my master's. Um, I finished off my BFA um, right before I actually went to the shelter, which is crazy. Like, how do you go from graduating college to that? It's this is just what's wrong with the economy today, really. It's so bad. Um, so then after that, I got my master's in entertainment business. And now I'm working on my doctorate in um, industrial and organizational psychology. Oh, so, so you went back to the fashion. 
Yes, I did. I mean, I have like two passions um, is the psychology and film. So I'm hoping to like um, make documentaries kind of like you. Um, I, I love making films and stuff like that. Um, I haven't done very much um, as far as like making a full series or anything like that. Um, but you know, that's just life takes you places, you know, so um, but yeah, that's kind of where I'm at right now. Anyways, <laughs> so do you still uh, speak to any of your relatives? Um, yeah, I do. Um, I talk to my brothers. Um, uh, one of them is married, so I talk to her a lot. Um, I also, um, my sister Bethany, um, although she's like gone through some uh, trials of her own, um, you know, I, I still try to keep in contact with her as much as possible. Um, it's really hard because, um, you know, it's it's not an easy relationship because um, she has just um, done a, made a lot of choices that make her a very untrusting person to be around my kids and to be around me. Um, so that's where those boundaries come into play. Um, but I still love her and I still make sure, you know, she's doing okay for the most part. Um, it's, it's an interesting uh, relationship when you um, have somebody who you're related to um, that you've known since you were a child that that, like, you know, is suffering so much from uh, mental illness, from drug addiction, um, because, you know, they really have to make that choice to get better on their own. And you could talk and talk and talk all day long about how it's like a good thing to go into a rehab. It's a good thing to get a job. It's a good thing to get, get a car. But unless they want to make that choice for themselves, they're never going to. So, um, you know, it's hard to see someone you really love and care about very deeply in that position because for you, it's like, okay, I know I need to get a job. I know I need to have shelter. But for them, their brains are like literally rewired to thinking, oh, I only need drugs. That's it. I just need drugs. And so that's very painful to watch. And then if they're bringing <laughs> their, um, you know, not very good choices into your home um, around your children, then you really have to be like, I'm sorry, but until- Because you are there to protect your kids first and foremost. Oh foremost. yeah, definitely, absolutely. So, so how did you name the second child, I'm curious? Oh, um, her name is Angel. <laughs> Oh, that's so beautiful. Thank love you. Love Angel. They're so adorable. Thank I you. love it. And so, so how old are they now? Love is six years old and uh, Angel is one years old. <laughs> uh, congratulations. That is Thank beautiful. you. Thank you so much. So, do you still speak to your parents or how is that relationship? Um, I mean, uh, I think what I've learned most from my relationship with them is better just to like, you know, not talk to them at all. <laughs> um, every them. time I talk to them, every time I, you know, let them in, you know, bad things happen. And it's just like, it's not a coincidence anymore. Now know. it's like, okay, there are bad news. It's like, yeah, you I mean, write down the dates where they are in your life and what happens during those times and the dates oh, where they're yeah. not in your life and what happens. <laughs> And it's strange how it's really black and white. Like they're there, disaster, they're not there, everything's perfect. Yes. So at some point it is the choice to make of, I prefer my life to be perfect and not with them than with them and disaster at what? Yeah, yeah. Totally on that I'm with you on that, totally. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And so how is your, so you're, you're newly wet now or? How yeah, I mean, we've lived together for going on four years. So oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it'll be four years in May. Um, so we we met um, on a dating app and we just been like a inseparable ever since. Um, I actually met him right when I came back from Florida, finally made it back to New York alive. Um, it was crazy down there, but I did it. I survived. Um, and so I came back to New York. I was living with my parents and I was working um, a part-time job and going to school. And um, I don't know. I was just like, I want, I still dream of my fairy tale wedding someday. Like I still dream of ma marrying my soulmate and my Prince Charming and all that fun stuff. 
And so I met him and we started talking and then we went to the movies. And ever since then, he's just like been around. <laughs> like he, the thing, the thing that kept him, there are two factors that I knew right away. I was like, oh, please. I like, I just want you to be in my life all the time. Number one factor is when I told him I was a single mom and I had a small daughter, he was like, oh, okay, cool. Like he did not run for the hills. So that was like factor number one. Factor number two is he was not scared by my parents. Any boyfriend I've ever had in the past was like, met my parents and they were like, bye. (laughs) He was just like, he was just like, he's like, these people are weird, but like, I'm, I'm staying with her. Like, I don't care. They can be as weird as they want. Like, but they're not going to scare me. And then my parents, of course, they're, they're very abusive. They say like the most horrendous things to me and my daughter when I was living with them. And one day in particular, he came over and he was just sitting on the stairs, just like waiting for me to finish up folding my laundry. And my parents started like just saying the most horrendous things to me in the world. And he just stood up and he just walked right over to them and he was like calling them out and he was like you know I'm not I won't get into like the exact verbal things that were said but he was just like you need to stop basically like you're just what is wrong with you like that's your daughter like what is wrong with you and my dad you know being all crazy and my mom being all crazy were like oh get out of our house like we're calling the cops on you and he was like go ahead I'm gonna tell them how horrible you are go ahead let's have them come over here and you can tell them exactly what you just said to your daughter and I was like no no cops please so I was like let's go let's go so you know me and my daughter and everything we got in the car and he we drove away and like I was like, oh my God. Like in that moment, as we're driving away, I was like, this is the man of my dreams. Like, <laughs> this is the man of my dreams. In, in shining armor. Yeah, like seriously, because you know, those don't really like exist these days. And like he, they do though. Like he's proof that they do. And you know, every boyfriend I ever had before him just never did that for me, never even thought about doing that for me. They they had their own problems, like, you know, so so yeah and so we kind of just been together every day and and you know it's it's crazy out there but like he makes he makes the world a little bit better for me so in a lot of ways i'm so happy for you priscilla i love the happy ending (laughs) and um so what would be the advice you would give to potentially someone who is currently in a relationship who knows or doubts that they might be in an what would be your advice or what would you tell them? Um, if, if you already know and you've already came to that conclusion that you, you don't feel good around this person, um, that's your, your um, consciousness telling you um, that's not a good place and you won't survive. And you'll either go insane or you'll like, you know, just end up in, a worse situation than you're already in. Um, because your instincts and your gut feelings, you know when that's happening. Like when you start feeling like anxiety and anxious around them and you start feeling like this big, that's those are all those warning signs that are telling you, I don't wanna live here anymore. So when your mind and your heart and your soul and are telling you this, you need to listen to that. Um, It's really hard at first, I think, um, because if it is your parents or it is the person you're married to or it's someone you've known a long time or maybe even just somebody you just met, um, you you don't really want to leave, but everything is telling you to. Um, And it's it's hard. It's going to be hard. But once you've actually like physically left that environment, you feel amazing. Like it doesn't matter. You're going to feel amazing. Um, you know, because it's true. You're, you finally have some peace. It's like being out of jail, right? It is like being out of jail. jail. It really is. Like, I remember I couldn't listen to my music that I really liked. And then once I left and I was out on my own, I blast my music all the time and it would feel incredible. And I just felt such a release from it because I'm finally just like expressing myself. And, um, you know, there is going to be a lot of um, 
you know, hardships, of course, but they're going to be so much easier to maneuver when you don't have that person in your life. That's just making it harder to deal with it. There's natural stressors in life, like being late for work or forgetting to clock in. <laughs> um, you know, there's natural stressors, but it all seems so much easier to deal with when you don't have that person just being like, calling you names and insulting you and putting you down and like making fun of you and taking your belongings. You know, if someone is like snatching your phone out of your hand, because you're literally trying to call for help, that person doesn't care about your safety. Like that, that call was going to make you feel safe and they don't care about that. And they're just taking it from you. You know, like that's not okay. Um, you know, any law enforcement is going to tell you like this person is not well and this person doesn't care about your well-being like if you want we can press charges you might not want to do that because you love this person it's okay to love them nobody's saying stop loving them it's just saying like live in a different environment um and if they do change and they prove that they've changed you can let them come visit. Still live in a different environment. Yeah. <laughs> you can still let them come visit. Um, <laughs> you know, there's ways, um, you know, on stuff like that. Um, but I would definitely just say, like, focus on your needs and things like that. It's okay to be a little selfish because really you're just self-caring yourself. You're just self-loving. You're practicing self-management. And those things are going to make you feel sane. And those kind of make you feel safe. Um, when you start getting very, like, heightened emotions and you start getting very fearful and you start getting the anxiety starts setting in, you know that you're not in a safe environment anymore and you're uncomfortable. And you just have have to speak up and say, look, this makes me uncomfortable and I don't want to do this and just walk away. If they don't walk away on their own, you're going to have to walk away because chances are if they're a narcissistic personality, they're never going to walk away. They're always going to try to find you and look for ways of using you. They're always going to try to be there trying to guilt you. Um, I learned this new term just recently. Um, it's like holding you emotionally hostage. And that's a huge thing. It, like, I never even heard of that, but it makes total sense. Just hearing it makes total sense to me. When you're feeling sad and they're taking advantage of that, they're holding you hostage in your mind. So that's the thing is if you can't see the physicalness of it, try to think of the mentalness of it because there's a lot going on up there and <laughs> you want that, you want your mind to be at ease. You know, you want to be doing your routine. You want to be doing what makes you happy. And the second that you're off your routine, the second you start feeling that like fearfulness and all that starts coming in to play, you know, you're not in a safe environment anymore. You know, you're not making safe. Yes, choices. when you start having to walk on eggshells and having the fear that something like I always feared that out of the blue, an explosion would happen. Like I wouldn't yeah. know where it came from or for what reason or, or like you said, I was too happy that day or, you know, I had a great news at work or something wonderful happened and literally psychologically I was waiting. I was just waiting for the catastrophe to like the punishment, the catastrophe. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. I know I'm going to be, I'm, I know I'm going to get hit because of this. I'm just wait, expecting the worst because at some point when I least expect it, it will hit me in, in the back of the head. Yeah. So if you feel like that, that you're walking on eggshells all the time, like I think people need to really, be conscious of how they're feeling and how someone makes them feel. If you start feeling belittled and doubting yourself and thinking you're crazy and thinking you are not allowed to speak too much your mind, you're not allowed to think a, a, on your own without asking permission, that's already a lot of red flags there. Oh, so. yes, definitely. All the above. Absolutely. I, I mean, I've, I've had, had that happen to me so many times, even in like work environments. It's not even just like people, you know, outside of work. Um, sometimes in work environments, you might have a manager or a coworker that acts like that around you. And it's like, oh God, here we go again. You know, like I need to be here. Like I need money. Like I just want my life to be so simple like that. Like I'll just clock in, do my little job, clock out, go 
home. But no, you got to have, you're dealing with all these, dodging all these different like th- emotions and people doing all these different things around you and it affects you. And, you know, I've had managers where they just like, I literally told them, I was like, look, I need less hours or I need to be able to make my own schedule um, so that I can spend more time with my family because that is what ultimately gives me joy. And I know I need money to take care of them, but at the same time, I need to think about my work-life balance. And the manager was like, no. I'm like, okay, first of all, I already know so much about you. I know that you are a single man who lives alone. You see your son a couple times a week. So you don't know what it's like for me. You don't know what I'm going through. Okay. And a lot of these managers these days I've noticed will be like, why don't you just be single and only see your kid a couple times a week like me? And I'm just like, cause that's not what makes me happy. <laughs> and yeah. you know, and then you I realized, okay. Lifestyle, like, of course. Yeah. I totally understand what you're saying. So yes, well, hopefully, I mean, hopefully this will help. Your story will help many others. I really hope it encourages people to know, even through hardships, even through shelters, even through having to help the grandma take a bath in a hotel and live through hell, there is still possibility of coming out on the other side with a very, very happy ending with love and joy. Love and angel joy, I should say. Yes. A beautiful marriage. So I want to really thank you, Priscilla, for taking the time today to share your story. I think it's so paramount because it will inspire and encourage other people to know um, and to hear it in your own words. And uh, if anyone wants to reach uh, Priscilla Bird, she said she was okay uh, to help encourage and discuss this more uh, and she is in the facebook group that we have now about NAVs, narcissistic abuse victims and survivors so just join the facebook group there is a link below and uh, and hopefully we see you there and uh, it's a really safe environment people share a lot of what they're going through we encourage each other we support each other we're there for one another And my goal is really to build a community of thrivers, community of survivors who, like uh, like I just spoke with Nikki, who thrive now after everything that they've endured and who can also give back. So help another human uh, get out and and hopefully thrive um, and know that there is a happy ending. There is a happy ending to this story. They exist. They do exist. (laughs) Thank you so much, Priscilla. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Bye. Bye.